And now we turn to our scripture for our lesson this morning. It comes from Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us go to him now in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Are you a forgiving person? Are you a person who doles out forgiveness? Or are you a grudge holder? Do you hold on to those wrongs and those hurts waiting for the person to come and make them right? This is what Jesus teaches within the prayer that he teaches and here at the end of the prayer. He teaches us about forgiveness. He teaches us to look within our own heart and decide, are we a forgiving person or are we a grudge holder? And so today we're going to dive into forgiveness. We're going to attempt to understand forgiveness. We're going to look at how God forgives. And by looking to him and understanding forgiveness, we can then better understand what it means to forgive others. Because you see, forgiveness in the abstract it's an easy thing. It's, it's quite easy to go up to a brother or sister in Christ and, and simply encourage them to forgive someone as if you could just snap your fingers and it's done and over with. But rather, it's harder than that. Corey Den, Ten Boom once uh, struggled with forgiveness and wrote about it and he kept her awake at night. She, she thought she had forgiven, but this feeling kept coming back to her. And so she went and talked to a priest and he said, it's like the clock tower bell. You were holding on to the rope, causing it to go ding, dong, ding, dong. And forgiveness is letting go of that rope. Even after you let go, there's still, for a time, the faint sounds of the ding, dong, ding, dong. Forgiveness is harder than just a platitude. And it stays with us a bit longer even after we've let it go. Oftentimes, it takes a while for the sound to slowly faint away. Forgiveness itself, it means to wipe the slate clean, to pardon the offender, to cancel the debt. For you see, forgiveness is an act of love and mercy and grace. Scripture tells us that we all are in need of forgiveness. Not one of us is exempt from needing it. When we turn to scripture, we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And we hear from the apostle John in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 8, where he writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And like David in his Psalm 51, verse 4, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Scripture is clear in what it teaches us that we all are in need of forgiveness. We all need to be forgiven. If we say we don't, we're liars. For it's declared in Romans 6.23 exactly why we need forgiveness. 
for the wages of sin are death. We need forgiveness so that we don't die. We need forgiveness so that, as Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous, those who are forgiven, into eternal life. Only the righteous, which we are not, unless we are joined with Christ, Apart from Christ, we are not righteous. We are not good. But we need forgiveness. As Jesus teaches in our scripture today about forgiving, being forgiven, and forgiving others, he does so as one who came to live and die so that we might be forgiven. And in 2 Peter chapter, five, chapter 3, verse 9, the apostle tells us, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Oh, how patient God is with us. Oh, we are prone to wonder. Oh, we are thick-headed, stiff-necked, hard-hearted. We often don't get the lesson the first time. In fact, in Scripture, Jesus often teaches the lessons multiple times and in threes. And still, we can spend our whole life and miss some of it. But he is patient with you. Not anyone wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so God, in his perfect plan, because became human in Jesus the Christ. And he died on the cross taking the penalty we deserve, death. He took the penalty for us. This is how God forgives. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul writes, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What happened on the cross when Jesus sheds his blood for those who come to faith in him is this. Is that our sins have been wiped clean. That when Jesus sees us, he does not see our sins, our rebellion, our wrongs, but rather he sees the righteousness that is the son Christ Jesus. And we are made right with him. We receive forgiveness. All of the debt we owed because of our sin is canceled. And the apostle John writes it this way in the second chapter, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then Paul when he told us that the wages of sin are death, in verse 23, he continues with this. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ Jesus our Lord. A free gift with no conditions. That's how God forgives. He doesn't wait on us to come meet condition X, Y, and Z and then receive forgiveness, but rather he humbled himself and put on the human form of Jesus and lived and died, shedding his blood so that we could be made righteous, so that we would be forgiven. For it's here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of the works, so that no one may boast. It's the gift of God. God does not wait for us to seek him and to seek forgiveness. God put in his perfect plan, the plan for our redemption before the foundation of the world. That means God had already planned on forgiving you. 
before you even messed up. That God, God is so wonderfully rich in mercy. He came so that we might be forgiven. God, our creator, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who formed us out of dust, the one who knows every hair on our head, the one who we rebelled against, the one who we sinned against. That while we were yet sinners in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our wrongs, sent Jesus to live and die and be resurrected so that we might be forgiven so that we might live in God's love. Oh, it's as the band sang, as Caitlin sang, forgiveness. It's like sweet honey. It sounds to our ears like a beautiful symphony. It is holy water. And it's there for you. It's there for those who go and put their faith and trust in Christ. For those who will call upon him as Savior and Lord. But in the scripture here, it seems as though forgiveness is conditional, right? It says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. That is by the classical definition, quid pro quo. Only that's not exactly what it means. We recall that Jesus just taught us how to pray. He taught believers how to pray. Those who had faith in him, he taught us how to pray and to seek him daily. And part of our daily prayer after our conversion, after we have come to faith and received forgiveness, he teaches us to go to God and ask forgiveness for ourselves as we have forgiven others. So Jesus here is teaching to believers. It's for the born again. Forgiveness, remember, is an act of love and mercy and grace. What Jesus teaches us is that if we have unforgiveness in our hearts against someone else, then we are not acting in a way that is pleasing to God or helpful to us. And so Jesus declares, here after he teaches us to pray, and even in our prayer, when he says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And then in this teaching, we are proclaiming that God don't forgive us because I haven't forgiven others. That's the walk of the Christian. We see later in Matthew, Jesus again teaches about forgiveness. And Peter comes to him and asks him exactly how many times Christians, believers, followers of Jesus are called to forgive someone else. And Jesus replies with an answer of not seven, not 70, but 77 times. And then he tells us a parable about forgiveness. There in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21, I believe it's through verse 35. And that is your homework this week, to go read that scripture. Go dive into it, to study it, and to let it rest upon your heart. Because at the end of it, he gives us the key. When he talks about forgiveness, he says, must forgive from our heart. For you see, this is where forgiveness comes from. That hard work of letting go of the rope. Comes from the heart. Because it's an act of love, of mercy and grace. What Jesus teaches here is that forgiven people forgive people. For us to forgive, well, it requires us to set our pride to the side, doesn't it? It requires us 
to let go of some conditions. It requires us to let go of control of the situation. In fact, it requires us to do exactly what God did, to humble ourselves and let love rule our hearts. You see, Scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, and never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so whenever we are wronged, whenever we are trespassed against, whenever we are sinned against, whenever we are hurt, as Christians... As believers, in response to the gospel, in response to us being sinners in need of grace and in the midst of it and receiving forgiveness, our response is to give it into God's hands, to give over the desires to harm or to pay back or to require conditions to the person who has wronged us. We give it back into God's hands because as believers, we know every wrong, every evil, every sin will ultimately be paid for. It'll be paid for one of two ways. Either it will turn out to be paid for by Christ when he died on the cross, or it will be paid for at final judgment. In either case. We can entrust it into God's hands. And then we're called to pray for the person to turn to Christ. Isn't that how we were treated? Isn't that the patience and the love and the mercy and the grace God has shown each and every one of us? That he sought to forgive us when we didn't deserve it? But isn't that also what makes it so hard? We were wronged. We were hurt. Can't just forgive the person. If I just let it go and let God handle it, where is my justice? No, for forgiveness, they must meet those requirements of X, Y, and Z before I can forgive them. See, forgiveness we always want for free when it comes our way, but when we want to give it out, we require conditions upon it. Isn't that what makes it so hard to give it over to God? Because we're all like Jonah, who was sent to Nineveh to preach the word of God, and yet he ran from it because he despised the people of Nineveh, knowing that if he preached the word of God, that if they heard of God who's rich in mercy as one who forgives, they would turn and Turn to God and God would forgive them. And he didn't want them to be forgiven. Isn't that the struggle we have in turning it over to God? He said, we know God is rich in mercy. We know our wrongs and our sins. And how much he forgave us. Probably so. For oh, how easy it is to receive grace, brothers and sisters. How easy it is for us to receive grace and mercy for our own sins. And at the same time, to deny it to others. What Jesus teaches in his prayer And what he teaches here at the end of his prayer in this text is for us to check our hearts. To take this moment to search and see who sits on the throne of our hearts. Is Christ on that throne? Or do we sit on that throne in our hearts? Who is the righteous judge? Me or Jesus? Dear Christian, let Jesus be not only your Savior, but may he also become 
the ruler, the king, the Lord of your heart and of your life. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the amount of grace and mercy you've shown us in our lives. The amount of sin you overcome, overcame in us to make us right with you. We thank you for that. We thank you that you are patient with us. And we ask that you would continue to work on us to let go of that rope, of that grudge, of those wrongs. Help us to be generous in grace and forgiveness as you have been generous with us. Help us to lean on you. And may we have the strength and the courage and the humility to take ourselves off the throne in our hearts and put Jesus there. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.